It's now five years since the Chinese government ordered the massacre of pro-democracy students in Tiananmen Square. Ever since then, there's been mounting concern about the so-called political prisoners being held by the Chinese. This week, President Clinton must decide whether China will retain its valuable, most favored nation trading status. Members of the U.S. Congress say it shouldn't. And later this week, they'll view the footage obtained by Sue Lloyd Roberts of China's forced labor camps, the Lao Gai. She traveled through Xinjiang province across the Gobi Desert, where some of China's 10 million prisoners are kept. Filming was done with a, a hidden camera, often in conditions of extreme danger for both herself and her guide, a former political prisoner. This is the first of five special reports for BBC Breakfast News from inside the Bamboo Gulag. Early morning and groups of prisoners, accompanied by guards, leave their barracks for another day of forced labour on one of a network of Lao Gai that cover the province of Xinjiang. Throughout China, some 10 million such prisoners are being put to work. These are the scenes that China does not want the outside world to see. For one in 10 of these men, their only crime is their political opposition to the regime. A thousand miles north in Urumqi, workers in the provincial capital set off for their day. Everyone here knows someone serving time in the camps. They all know that a petty crime, a wrong political move, an act of civil disobedience could land them there too. Notice boards in the city advise citizens of the Lao Gai network as a deterrent to crime and political opposition. But should they fall astray, then they'll add to the ready supply of able-bodied workers so crucial to the country's economy. The guards of the province's public security ministry, all one million of them, are paid for by the production work in the Lao Gai. The prisons produce up to a third of the goods available in the shops and account for half Xinjiang's foreign exports. The network starts here in the capital, a line of enclosed prisons on the city's perimeter. Using a hidden camera, I walked several kilometers to get round them. From a building opposite, you could see one group of prisoners being marched into a factory building, while a second group tills the fields, ensuring that the prisons are self-sufficient. Here on the prison walls, the red characters spell out the slogan found on all Lao Gai, reinforce the people's democratic dictatorship, while the small notice boards spell out the prison's commercial purpose. The top sign says, prison number two, while underneath is written, pharmaceutical company. Round the back, there's even a prison shop where they sell leather jackets, all treated by the prisoners, I'm told, and exported abroad. In a restaurant set against the prison walls, I hear of more sinister aspects of prison life. The guards come in here and eat, the cook says, and they tell us about the executions. We often hear the shooting. They used to be in public, but no more. Today, they shoot them inside the prison walls. A thousand kilometers to the south, they call this part of the Gobi Desert Takalamagan, or the place where you can get in but can't get out. The only things moving out are the lorries carrying the grain, fruit, and cotton produced in the desert Lao Gai. My guide, Harry Wu, himself a former political prisoner for 20 years, explains that a prisoner could be left in the desert for life unless his performance satisfies his guards on all counts. In Chinese forced labor camp, all prisoners in China have two performers, labor performers, political performers. If you, your performers not satisfy, not meet the condition, and they will increase your sentence, and you never come out again anymore. In a 2,000 kilometer trawl through the desert, we came across dozens of camps. Even the driver boasts that Xinjiang province has the biggest and best labor camps in China. From early morning to evening, groups of prisoners are seen marching to and from the fields, where they work six days a week and then attend evening classes in political re-education. Most of them are here on long-term sentences or for life. Local people complain about them. Thousands of them came here in 1983 when Deng Xiaoping launched his campaign against crime, and they're still here, they say with bitterness. The presence of the Lao Gai's efficient labor force invites envy among peasants who are trying to eke out a living in the desert. It's like the Soviet Union here. They expelled their criminals to Siberia. 
Here, we expel them to Xinjiang. They're good workers who come from the big cities like Beijing and Shanghai. They do better than us because the state policy is that prisons should make money while we're left to struggle. It's all organized with military precision, with regiments and battalions, each with several thousand prisoners under their command. Barracks and watchtowers spring out of the desert at regular intervals, making up what China's critics call the bamboo gulag. Pretending to be lost travelers with a camera concealed in a bag, they get the closest yet to China's forced laborers. Every day there's a strict production quota to be met by all prisoners, criminal, political, and even those who can wait for years for a trial. But all areas like these are forbidden to foreigners, and within seconds we're approached by police and I'm marched off the field. Back at the barracks, a prisoner who's ill with stomach cancer is left to guard the piles of cotton that have been picked. I was 18, he says, when I was involved in a street fight in Shanghai, and along with hundreds of others, I was sentenced to life here in Xinjiang. There are a few political prisoners here too. If you work hard, you can get your sentence reduced, but only if you can prove you've been politically re-educated. He showed us the bread buns he'd been left to eat that day, each as hard as stones. When asked why security was so lax, he said there was nowhere to escape to. The few attempts to escape the desert camps have all ended in capture and execution. The prisoners here in Xinjiang tend to be long-term, and the emphasis is on punishment rather than commercial exploitation. 2,000 miles to the east in Xinjiang province, we have the image of China's commercial life the country would like us to see contented peasants picking tea by hand. The reality is rather different. A group of prisoners leave their barracks to pick tea. A third of all tea in China comes from forced labor camps. The farm here is one of the best organized and mechanized in China. The equipment is Japanese. The tea is top quality, destined for the world market. 2,000 miles to the south in Canton, the world's tea buyers sample China's produce. This is the nearest that most of them get to seeing the raw product. John Leader from the British firm Twining says he trusts the Chinese dealers he buys from not to sell him forced labor products, but he admits there's no guarantee. As far as the world tea industry is concerned, the only way for the world at large to guarantee that no tea came from labor camps would be to stop buying China tea. And, and I think that is a commercial, doesn't make commercial sense. Tea is just one part of it. This valley in Sichuan province is a military area forbidden to outsiders. On every hillside there's a Laogai, a forced labor camp. There are believed to be hundreds of such camps across the country. From Manchuria to Canton, from Shanghai to Tibet. They share the same characteristics, political slogans on the walls, lines of prisoners constantly on the move, maintaining a 24-hour work program under the surveillance of an army of guards. Here along the Dadu River, there's a string of asbestos mines. Piles of the stuff, forbidden in the West now for more than 10 years, lie dumped along the roads. Prisoners covered in asbestos dust carry the lethal material manually from the mines and then mix it with water for industrial processing. An example of the disregard for the lives of prisoners who play such an important part in China's economy. From the outside, the Wuli machine tool factory in Shijiang province looks part of China's smart new capitalist image, but behind the walls, it's another prison complex. Former inmates say some 8,000 prisoners are employed here. Prison number four has won production medals in China, and the chain hoists made by these prisoners have been sold to the West. The Laogai system must be one of the most efficient production lines in the world. It's infinitely versatile. Prisoners can be employed on construction or in the fields to harvest crops without a penny spent on labor. One prisoner was brave enough to speak out. My family have to provide me with clothes, he says, and give me money to buy food. We prisoners get nothing for our work. But human rights are not uppermost in the minds of the thousands of delegates making deals at Canton's trade fair. Cotton fabric manufactured from cotton picked by prisoners attracts eager buyers. 
Traders who find machine tools priced well below those made in the West are not concerned about where they come from. Here at the show, about 50% of the um, companies are trading companies, or maybe not quite 50%, but about that. So who knows where they're getting their products from? And basically, uh, the buyers aren't asking. They don't want to know. We hear about it on our TVs and in the paper and whatever, but no, it doesn't, it doesn't affect us at all. We don't really like that, but I mean, it's not our, our, of, uh, our business. Even though U.S. Customs seized over a million dollars worth of Laogai made products over the last three years, the brand names change regularly, and they're filtered through trading companies, and they're hard to detect. Even with America threatening to increase their surveillance on these items, the system is almost impossible to police. China's critics claim that products made in the Laogai account for hundreds of millions of dollars in export earnings every year. Those who run these prison factories will do their best to keep their production source hidden from their buyers. Behind the camp, a sprawling graveyard. Many prisoners, unable to stand the beatings and torture, commit suicide. Some graves are marked by families who've managed to track down their fathers, sons and brothers to this desolate place, but the majority are unmarked. No one knows how many thousands have died in China's forced labor camps, the Lao Gai. It's believed 10 million prisoners are held here today, of whom 10% may be political, including the leaders of the protest of Tiananmen Square. Despite international outrage, there's no sign of the system changing. Su Lloyd Roberts, BBC News, Tiananmen Lao Gai, Xinjiang Province. This is NBC Nightly News with Tom Brokaw. Good evening, and just as the health care debate is getting underway, the cornerstone of the Clinton presidency, after all, the White House is also preparing to deal with another explosive issue. That's trade with China. Should China get preferred status, even though it continues to violate human rights? The president must decide in June, and as NBC's Andrea Mitchell tells us tonight, today the pressure was on from both sides. Using a hidden camera, former Chinese dissident Harry Wu sneaked back into China to take these pictures. Pictures, he says, reveal five prisons where inmates perform forced labor, including the manufacture of goods exported to the United States. Chinese forced labor can is a machine, mechanism, for support the autocracy system. No overall significant progress has been made in terms of, uh, of human rights. Only today, the State Department said that China had kept its promise to stop using forced labor for U.S. exports. But NBC News has learned that as a result of these pictures, the U.S. will now ask China to permit inspections of these prisons. Top officials tell NBC News that the president wants to find a way to separate trade from progress on human rights, but that the new evidence could be a serious setback. So is a new report by Human Rights Watch Asia, documenting how guards at Beijing Prison No. 2 get other prisoners to use iron rods, batons and rubber tubes against political dissidents. The administration says there has been some progress. China will talk about no longer jamming the voice of America. One option is to renew favorable trade status, but place sanctions on the Chinese military, which also produces consumer products. Business leaders say that would be impossible to enforce. What are we going to do, hire another 10,000 customs inspectors to go around checking on all of this? I mean, we have a budget, you know. There is also broad support in Congress to have no restrictions at all. Disrupting trade and supporting human rights goals would work against the forces that are liberalizing China. Officials tell NBC News they are looking for other ways to keep the pressure on China, but do expect the president will renew China's favorable trade status before the June 3rd deadline. Andrea Mitchell, NBC News at the White House. from New York, everyone. I'm Thalia Schurz. Good morning. I'm Boyd Matson. It's two weeks and counting until President Clinton must decide whether China still deserves a break on tariffs. A Clinton administration official says the president sent a secret envoy to meet with Chinese officials earlier this month to discuss U.S. demands for progress on improving human rights. China's status is also being debated on Capitol Hill. Here's ABC's John McCleffey. This is the political battlefield in front of the cameras where the fight over how to deal with China's human rights abuses is being fought. The situation in China 
by all accounts, has gotten significantly worse. Harry Wu is a dissident who There's spent nearly 20 yeah. years in Chinese prisons. He claims many products, ranging from stuffed animals to steel pipe, are made in China with prison labor and sold to American companies illegally. White House says the jury is still out on China and human rights. Certainly we'll look into any specific allegations of prison labor being used for products that are imported into the United States. President Clinton has two weeks to certify that human rights practices in China have improved in the last year. If they have not, he is obligated by law to penalize China. One way is taking away most favored nation trade status. That would dramatically raise prices for Chinese goods sold in America, such as toys, shoes, and clothes. A growing number in Congress now say a trade war with China makes no sense. Disrupting trade in support of human rights goals would work against the forces that are liberalizing China. Last year, Congress pushed hard for the president to take a tough stand against China. This year, much of the pressure is gone, and when the president makes his decision, even human rights activists expect that he will not penalize China beyond a slap on the wrist. And when looking for ways to pressure Beijing in the future, he will try to do so without disrupting trade. John McQuethy, ABC News, Washington. Human rights groups are turning up the heat on President Clinton to reject special trade status for China. Under pressure from U.S. companies, the president is expected to renew most favored nation trading status for China in the next few weeks. But as Peter Barnes reports, human rights activists say China hasn't earned it. Human rights activists claim this video smuggled out of China shows prisoners who make hand tools exported to America. If so, it means that China is cheating on a 1992 promise to stop shipping products made with prison labor to the U.S. China critics say that that alone is all President Clinton needs to revoke Beijing's special trading privileges with America. Uh, things are not getting better in China. They're getting worse. Human rights groups are turning up the heat on the president two weeks before he must decide whether to renew China's most favored nation trading status. In another tack, Human Rights Watch released a report Wednesday disclosing names of even more dissidents locked up in Chinese jails. The groups say the president should keep up the pressure. International pressure will be a key component in determining how the Chinese authorities respond, whether they allow, in the long run, some greater flexibility on the political side or whether they simply crack down harder. But the activists are fighting an uphill battle. MFN allows China to export products to the U.S. under special low tariffs. Last year, the president said he wouldn't renew MFN unless China made significant progress on human rights. But under heavy pressure from U.S. companies, the president is expected to renew MFN, though with some limited conditions, such as restrictions on Chinese rifles and other products made by the Chinese army. U.S. companies want to avoid a trade war to keep their access to China's fast-growing economy. One official's laryngitis didn't stop the new message. Clearly, we have very real um, human rights concerns with China, and clearly we have very, very important commercial opportunities um, in China, and so a balance has to be struck. The White House said it will investigate the new prison labor charges as part of its MFN review. Peter Barnes, CNBC Business News, Washington. Thank you. 
事情，包括那件事情。你大学的时候，他们很勇敢。对啊，应该是的。下车吧，这个你说话嘛。对啊。样不好，应该看得见的。啊？应该看得见的。左边没问题，右边。对啊，对啊，是朋友，他看着我干嘛？拿手去扯，拿手去扯给你，知道吧？啊，你微信不？嗯。这个景德世界上第一流，因为它又在，正好在那个什么上面。在电话哎。有没有啊？当然有。没事了，我已经买下来。这个包里的手机卡，你拿你的围巾做点手势行不行？你你抖抖落一在底下的包里。今天是一九九四年四月二十八号下午四点，我们在山上看到五菱机机场的犯人，他们是正在运钞。拍，今天拍。但已经有了。再拍。拍。啊，这边，这边。拍拍，等好近点。不要不要不要，拍拍拍一圈三个人被伸到我前面了，再拍这个，这一队走
快快，杵着我脑袋，搞点，行了，要要收起来。一九九四年四月三十号，在新的在闹桥五一机械厂，地点在闹桥，港楼上还没有电网，高一的犯人刚刚出来，枪很高。他这个速度很快，而且大部分这个，你看，首先注意看这个安全。有没有照进去检查？没事。因为现在有，地方有那个，有那个。说多少人在这给送？白毛岭中厂南面的一个火葬场，这个地方叫做万人坑。这个山头，待会儿别急。哦，我在等是老这个，能通知吧？你当地老百姓都知。慢，你转太快了。
，估计和我们那个五大队那里差不多，也也也是这样。楼上会不会有人？楼上会。